What's up, everyone? Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. Of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Now, today is Friday, June 16th, 2023. Uh, this is a pre-recorded episode because I am out. I'm at the Grand Canyon Star Party. So if you happen to find yourself there in the next couple of nights, stop by, say hi. Be happy to talk to you. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about star hopping. Uh, we are, it does say with manual dobs, but we are going to just talk about it in general. Um, I'm going to try and keep it on the topic of star hopping, but I also want to talk about how understanding the nighttime sky can help you, even if you're an astrophotographer um, or you're using a go-to telescope and why it's beneficial. Um, but let's talk about star hopping here real quick. But before we get started, if you know you like watching us and you want to support the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. It keeps us going and it keeps the channel moving forward and helps us grow. If you have an idea for a future episode, please email us at info at skywatchusa.com and title it What's Up. I will let you know that we generally book these by quarter. So if you don't see your episode pop up, we'll try to get it in there, uh, but it might take some time. All right. So if you're not familiar with the nighttime sky and you want to know how to navigate it and you need to know how to bounce around, what is that called? Well, that's called star hopping. Star hopping is the process where you can basically navigate through the constellations, finding a target without the aid of go-to or electronic assist like encoders. Now, star hopping is a great way to get started in astronomy and honestly if you're a beginner i highly recommend one of the first things that you do is become acquainted with the nighttime sky understand how it, the orientation works understand where north south east west get your bearings be able to identify where the north star is or if you're in the southern hemisphere where the north celestial pole is but become acquainted with it. Be able to name off some constellations. Go out and actually become familiar with what constellations are up. And of course, this process is going to take about a year because the sky is constantly rotating or the earth is rotating. Um, so you're going to have to take some time to orient yourself with the various constellations uh, that are available in your area. And obviously that's going to dictate if you're in the north or southern hemispheres at that point. But anyway, I always recommend if you're a beginner, don't jump in too quickly to adding a bunch of gear. Go out and spend some time understanding the nighttime sky, learning where the constellations are and things like that. Now, once you learn where the constellations are, you start to be able to find certain objects without the need of electronics at all. You become well aware about where a handful of these objects are going to be, and you're able to locate them without any need of go-to or electronics at this point. So that's cool. But there's a lot of people out there that just completely bypass that. Either my light pollution's too bad or whatever the reason is. I understand that's very difficult. But you can still go out and learn the basic constellations for most places. And you can actually apply that knowledge to astrophotography or go-to telescopes or whatever. So if you're not familiar with what star hopping is, you're basically using the stars to navigate to various objects in the nighttime sky. You should be able to figure out where the ring nebula is, where the lagoon nebula is, where the Pleiades is, blah, 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 blah. There's thousands of objects up there that you should be able to locate. And there's not a test on it, but having the simple understanding of where a collection of objects are in the sky can be beneficial because it means you understand how the sky works, where some constellations are, and you can apply that knowledge down the road because you could find out, hey, my go-to telescope isn't pointing in the right direction. Or, hey, 
I can't image this target because it's behind a tree in my backyard or whatever the case may be. When you become aware of the nighttime sky, it can allow you to be uh, your use and mileage when using an electronically based telescope can be much more beneficial because you have an understanding of what and where it needs to go and you know if it's wrong or not. Um, we become too reliant on electronics that I've had countless friends where their battery on their telescope dies and they can't do anything. Even if they have a perfectly good telescope, they're just like, well, I'm done. That shouldn't be the case. You should be able to go undo the clutches on your telescope and manually observe it. Don't waste your evening out. Spend a little time becoming aware of the nighttime sky and the constellations and then you can go from there. So star hopping is taking that one step further. We know the constellations, and now we want to bounce around to find certain objects in the sky. Now, I kind of equate this to kind of like going to a friend's house. People seem to be impressed where it's like, wow, you found the ring nebula really fast. Well, I know that it sits between the two stars in the constellation of Lyra, it's very easy to find, and that's because I've done it for years. So it's very similar to driving to a friend's house. The first time you drive to your friend's house, the first time you're going over there, you probably need directions. Maybe you're using GPS. Whatever the case may be, you're navigating there. But over time, you've gone there so much to where you could probably do it in your sleep. And that's what happens when you go out and you practice and observe the nighttime sky, too. You become acquainted enough with a variety of objects that you can actually find them without even knowing how to do it. Um, you just know that it's there. Now that process gets more difficult as the objects get fainter and more obscure and less charted. So we need to figure out how to find these um, objects that are very difficult, even some that are not so difficult. Maybe we're just not familiar with them and be able to figure out how to locate them. And star hopping is how you do that. Now, how do we know where we're going? Uh, we probably need a map or a chart. Now, star charts are basically what we have to reference. And there's obviously two ways to go about star charts now if you have technology. There's the physical book and the printed charts. And then, of course, there's the electronic apps and stuff like that, which the apps like Sky Safari have kind of taken over. I myself use the apps like Sky Safari Pro because it's so much easier to lug my iPad or my phone out there and look for an object and have millions of objects in my pocket rather than lugging out a bunch of books and charts in a big bin like we used to do. Um, now, real quick before I get started, just to kind of give... A perspective of how I've done this. So I started astronomy in 1999. So I got my first telescope and I had to learn the nighttime sky because astrophotography was not obtainable to me at that time. Digital astrophotography was still in the early stages in the early 2000s. Like there were, there were production cameras and all that fun stuff, but it, we didn't have like ZWO or QHY where all these cameras were just obtainable for nothing. You wanted a serious camera, you're going to spend thousands of dollars on it. And that was really reserved for those who had the money to do it. Just imaging was not a big thing. Um, it is a big thing, but it's not as big. It wasn't as big as it is now. Now it's super obtainable. When I was getting started, astrophotography was not an easily obtainable thing without spending thousands of dollars. So you were kind of forced to stick with visual, which isn't a bad thing. But what I liked about that was it forced you to learn the nighttime sky. And knowing the nighttime sky allows me to apply that knowledge now to using a go-to telescope and imaging. So I'm able to then tell, hey, the telescope's not pointing in the right direction, or hey, that's not where that is, or that's not what it looks like. You're able to call out that this isn't working correctly because you can tell that we're not in the right constellation or we're just to the right of that star or whatever the case may be. You're aware that this isn't a thing um, and it's not working right. So understanding the nighttime sky 
learning how certain cons where certain constellations are when they're up and visible can actually make your time more useful when you finally go to imaging or you're using go to you can understand if things aren't working properly because you can always go back to manual and realize okay i need it to be here instead of here if that makes sense so um anyway so when we want to learn how to do star hopping we need to kind of learn the constellations and I like to do that in a variety of different ways. So I'm going to kind of jump around here real quick. So in the nighttime sky, it looks like this. We go outside. Maybe it's dark. You're at a star party. There's the Milky Way. There's a bunch of stars everywhere. Um, most of our charts, however, are going to have the constellation lines put into it. And the way I like to go about it is that the constellations are states. The stars are the big cities and the cool little off the beaten path um, places that we want to go are the faint fuzzy objects we're trying to find. That's how I break this down mentally. I don't want to skip too far ahead though. So that's how I break that down. So how am I able to find objects? How do I locate something? How do I learn about different objects? Well, the internet's obviously very helpful, but there's also charts and books. And I know that's probably a weird thing in today's vast technological landscape but still using a book or a printed chart is very helpful to reference and there's all kinds of stuff out there available now there's night watch there's backyard astronomers guide pocket sky atlas the night sky observers guide uh, on alls of deep sky there's like nine of those there's a ton of books out there that you can reference now what i like about these kinds of books. Maybe you don't lug these out into the field with you. Maybe you leave them at home in your library. But what I like about these books is there's something that you can sit down, crack open, and research a target. You can open up a const uh, an area about a certain constellation, let's say Cygnus, because it's summertime. Maybe you open that up and you start looking for particular objects that are in the nighttime sky. A lot of times the way I find something of interest is I'll be looking in a constellation for an object. Let's say we're in Cygnus. I want to know where the Crescent Nebula is, NGC 6888. I, I kind of know where it's at. I know it's in Cygnus. Let's open up the book. Okay, I found that it's not far from Sadir, um, which is around the central portion of Cygnus. But then as I start looking around, I'm also seeing that there's all kinds of other charted objects in here. There's an open cluster over here. There's a nebula over here. There's a lot of interesting things in this region. I wouldn't know about that if I hadn't sat and actually done a little bit of digging and referenced the particular region. That's why I like using star charts still. I may not use them in the field as much anymore because I've gone to my phone and I still have my star chart basically in an app form. But I like having books to reference when I'm at home. Maybe you want to make a list and go through and find something that you want to do and observe when you get to your dark sky site. That's where I feel having charts and books like this can actually help refine your skill a little bit because it's like, hey, I'm going to be in this. I know that Cygnus and Scorpio and Sagittarius are going to be up when we go out. I'm going to dig through my books and kind of comb through what's in those constellations and see if there's anything interesting. And if I find there's something interesting that I might want to observe, I'll add it to my list. Then I'll go online and do some research, maybe find some pictures, be like, oh, this looks very interesting. We should observe it. And then I'll add that to my list that I'm going to go take to the observing field. And then we're going to star hop and try to find it. Uh, but a lot of that initial research goes early before we go into that. Or maybe it's a rainy day when you're out at a star party or it's just the daytime. You've got nothing to do. What do you want to do tonight? What should we observe? Crack open a couple of the charts, pick a constellation and start looking for an object. And that's what I like about having star charts still. And I would actually push, even if you're an astrophotographer or someone using a go-to telescope, don't sit there and just rely 
on whatever your ASI Air tells you. Here's the cool things for tonight. That's a great way to start and great way to, but if you know you're into this and you're looking for something cool and off the beaten path, get a book, open up, look for some inspiration beyond just what this computer tells you or what your hand controller tells you. Don't be afraid to actually look and dig and do a little bit of research and learn about something different. That's actually the whole reason why we do target of the month is because we want to encourage people to go off the beaten path and look for some of these cool things that maybe you never would have thought about observing or imaging. When you start off learning how to star hop and understanding the sky and learning about different objects, you tend to do more research about what object you're looking for. And through the research, you end up finding other objects that you're interested in. And it expands your knowledge of the nighttime sky because you have to look where they are. You have to understand how to find them. What time of year are they going to be visible? There's some quasars that I would like to observe in my big dot, but they're not going to be up until the winter time or whatever the case may be. I have to wait, but I found them. I made a note and go on from there. But it's not bad to have these books in your library. This could be used for star hopping. This could be used for expanding your knowledge of the nighttime sky or looking for something cool to image. You could apply this knowledge to all of that. Now, there's a lot of very uh, experienced observers out there. Um, and being an experienced observer means you spend a lot of time at the eyepiece observing the subtle nuances of various telescopes or maybe you just use one telescope but you know it inside and out your eye becomes trained on what to observe and when you actually take the time to sit and relax and spend a considerable amount of time at the eyepiece you will be able to see how things are going that evening is your telescope operating the way it should all of that is refined when you go out and observe. So, uh, but I was gonna say is, if you wanna talk to someone who has done, who's very acquainted with the nighttime sky and has probably rummaged through a fair amount of these, I would bet about 90% of the large Dob owners at a star party have a pretty deep knowledge of deep sky observing and star hopping. Now, obviously there is go-to systems and all kinds of tracking systems that can be observed um, and placed on DOBs nowadays. And even if you own a large telescope, that doesn't mean you're incredibly knowledgeable about this, but odds are, let's say you're going in cold, you know nothing about the people there. If you're going to visit a star party, there's a fair chance that those who own the large dobs have been through these charts and have made lists and know how to star, star hop and understand the nighttime sky. They're a great collection of information that you can go and pick their brains. And I'm sure they would love to talk to you about various objects. Um, now that's not to say that's completely accurate but that's a good chance that those who own the large Dobbs because they're looking for stuff that's really pushing the limit of their equipment. That's why they have a large telescope is they want to dig into the sky. Talk to them about deep sky observing, how they got started with star hopping. Now there is a collection of some really good observers out there who probably most of them own large Dobbs that actually share their observations online. They share their notes and how they've observed and how to find these very obscure objects online. And a couple of them um, have some very nice websites. Number one is Alvin Huey. This is faintfuzzies.com. I have not had the privilege of meeting Alan, or Alvin, I'm sorry. Um, I've not had the privilege of meeting Alvin, but he is a fantastic deep sky observer. And he has spent an enormous amount of time at the eyepiece, but also he spent a ton of time compiling and making amazing charts and organizing them in such a way that you can go through and find all kinds of objects. Um, so he has observing guides. 
Um, these are, I believe, available for purchase. But he also has these downloadable observing guides, and they are organized by whatever their targets are. So he has got varied, very challenging. Um, these are uh, Palomar complex galaxies. Just, just crazy off the beaten path stuff. This is far and beyond the Messier catalog. But this is generally the thought of someone who's doing very serious deep sky observing that they want to find and locate these faint little fuzzies. Um, but he has a great collection of stuff that him and uh, colleagues of his have put together um, and made an incredible collection of very detailed uh, charts and atlases that you can reference if you're looking for very obscure targets. Obviously, the books and stuff like that are a great place to start. They're going to get your feet wet, but eventually you're going to want to start finding things that are way out there. And there's some of these charts that if you're approaching this from an imaging standpoint, there's some objects in here that are not going to be in your ASI Air. They are not going to be in your telescope's hand controller. This is where you're stepping into the deep end. And this is where knowing how to star hop or at least having a basic knowledge of the nighttime sky is going to allow you to tap into things far and beyond what your electronics are going to have at your disposal. And they're going to show you that there are other catalogs and fainter objects out there. Now, I'm not saying you need to know how to star hop. I recommend that you do. But what I am saying is that you should know some of the basic constellations. And by understanding how to find obscure targets via star hopping will encourage you to open your mind to doing some research and finding new objects to image or use on your go-to telescope or whatever. But looking to find those objects from a deep sky observer's perspective might encourage you to go further off the deep end and find some really cool targets. So this is faintfuzzies.com. I love this place. I've downloaded several of them. I've even printed out some of them into big binders um, that I can reference at any time that I want. And that's really the big thing is I can reference it. I know Hercules is going to be up. Maybe I should go through and find the objects that are in Hercules. Maybe there's some really weird stuff in there. Um, but faintfuzzies.com is very nice. Um, there's also this one, observing.skyhound.com, which I believe they just changed. Um, but you go to deep sky objects by the month. This place is awesome because uh, it covers all kinds of stuff, whether it's easy or really difficult. They do a very good job here. Like they have a newbie section, like right here. They have M35, M37, 81, 82 easy this is easy stuff but if you want to get started in star hopping there's the charts they show you how it works they've got notes on it fantastic stuff this is amazing information if you're looking to get started and they have it in various apertures as well um, like binoculars all the way up to observations made in a larger 18 uh, so on and so forth and then they have it documented there but it's a lot of good information here and you, I really recommend that you spend some time going through here because it'll open your mind and your knowledge of what's up there. And so you're not just stuck observing the Messiers or the same bright NGCs. Like, there's all kinds of cool things out there. But the fun thing I find about this stuff is being able to not just be, okay, it exists, but how are we going to find it? And from a deep sky observer's perspective, that's the fun part is the challenge of trying to find it. Um, and then, of course, see it if it's very obscure. So that's what I would recommend if you're just getting started is get a good, good set of charts or download something. Of course, there's always planetarium apps. I use Sky Safari Pro all the time. It has basically everything that we just talked about. But what I'll do before going out is I'll spend some time looking for particular objects, finding the charts, maybe looking through some of those books and then locating it in Sky Safari and making my observing list. And then that way I can go star hop 
to it sooner rather than later. But I always recommend you become familiar with the sky. That's the fundamental thing I'm trying to get across right now is become familiar with the sky. Maybe you don't know how to find the Ring Nebula or M81 and M82, but you should know that's the Big Dipper. That's Scorpius. Uh, that's the Hunter. Whatever the case may be, you should be able to look up and orient yourself uh, to the sky and what's up there because that's going to make your time with your telescope easier and if you have a go-to telescope or you're imaging and using plate solving you can actually understand that hey my telescope's not pointing the right direction hey that target's not there whatever because you know and you know enough about the sky to understand that that's not the right direction so i think it's important that you become acquainted with the nighttime sky now the next step from that is using the nighttime sky and being able to navigate with it. But all this can be applied to some extent to go to in imaging. Now, equipment. Um, equipment is very basic when it comes to star hopping. Uh, the first thing I would recommend is you need a telescope. Uh, Dobsonians are very fun telescopes to actually do observing with. The nice thing about a Dobsonian is it's the biggest bang for the buck if you want aperture. And if you're doing deep sky observing, the name of the game is aperture. You wanna collect as much light as possible to be able to see those faint fuzzies. The more light you're gonna get, the more structure you'll get in the brighter objects and the fainter objects you'll be able to see. So aperture is always helpful, at least when we're doing deep sky. Now, most dobs, um, the most popular sizes are between eight and 12 inch. Um, eight inch is big enough to where you can really get some nice views, especially in a dark sky site. It's very manageable, but eight to 12 inch is usually fairly manageable, uh, for most people. 12 inch is when galaxies start to pop. It's just kind of a magic number. Uh, but a 12 inch telescope, you've got some serious aperture at that point in a dark sky site. You could be very busy. I have friends who all they have are 12 inch dobs and they are fantastic observers. They're able to locate all kinds of things up there. And with a dark sky and a 12 inch, it's a very easy combination to get very serious about deep sky observing. Um, of course, then you get the aperture bug and you wanna go bigger. Um, if you're looking for something serious, and you want the serious aperture, but you don't want it to basically take over your life, I would usually recommend something between 16 and 20 inch. Um, anything above 20, you're getting pretty hardcore about. Um, and they're phenomenal instruments, but things get very big very quickly and it becomes more difficult to lug around. Um, my 28 needs a trailer and I love my 28 but I had a 20 inch obsession before I had my 28 and that was a fantastic telescope too. Um, 20 inch is probably my favorite aperture size. If you're looking for a daub, especially if you can find a fast 20 inch, like a modern day, something like F4 to F3. Uh, the one that you see right in front there, that dark gray one, uh, that's my buddy's telescope. That's a 20 inch F3 on a tracking platform. So he still has to find it. He has to move it manually, but he has tracking, which is awesome. 20 inch will keep you busy for your entire lifetime and more as would a 12 inch, but a 20 inch, everything looks awesome in a 20 and 20s. While some of you find that 20 is probably a big telescope, having owned a 28, a 20 is very manageable in comparison. So 20s are big until you go bigger than 20. And then you realize just how easy a 20 inch daub actually is. Um, so if you're looking for a sweet spot and you want to be very serious about deep sky observing, 16 to 20 inch, those will fit in most modern hatchbacks um, or small SUVs. Works really well. Um, they're very easy to move around. You can star hop with them. Da -da. A good finder is also going to be something that goes a long way. Now, my personal favorite, as most, is the Telrad. If you don't know what a Telrad is, well, shame on you. You should know what a Telrad is. Uh, this is a Telrad. This little goofy box looking thing. They're like 50 bucks. 
They run on, I think, two double A's, two triple A's. They last forever. And it's like a jet heads up display. So there's a there's a um, a light inside that's got a target, and that relays up to a lens and projects it on this piece of glass it's like a heads up display. And you look right through the glass, and there's a target projected on the sky. It's awesome. And that right there makes it very easy once it's dialed in to point your big telescope wherever you want. Most large telescopes I find don't even have an optical finder, like a little 9 by 50 Some of them do. A lot I notice don't. It's just a Telrad. The Telrad gets you in the vicinity, and then you hop in the eyepiece, and then that's when the search starts. But a Telrad, by far, is the finder of choice if you are looking to do star hopping. Um, another one, which I don't have a picture of is the Rigel finder. The Rigel finder is kind of like a Telrad. It's just a little bit different setup, but it works the same way. A little smaller, has a smaller footprint. Um, I've used one of those before. They work very well. Um, but the Telrad is my favorite. All right. So let's talk about the night sky. This is where you start getting in the nitty gritty at this point. So let me bring up, uh, Stellarium. Stellarium is basically another one of those apps. It's like Sky Safari Pro. It's a planetarium software. This one's free. And this is a great way to become familiar with how star hopping works. So like I said earlier, it's best that you become acquainted with the night sky. Now, obviously, this is what the night sky looks to all of us. You know, especially if we go out to a dark sky, you see the Milky Way. There's tons of stars out there. Ta-da. But learning the basic constellations, learning that this over here is Scorpio and Sagittarius looks like the teapot and things like that, the Summer Triangle, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, um, that's all important because when you reference your star charts, they're all going to have the lines. So like I said earlier, how I approach this, how I've explained it to other people is... The constellations are your states. Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, California, states. The constellations are the states. The bright stars that make up the constellations are the big cities. They're cool to see, but that's not what we're looking for. The faint fuzzies that lie between the stars are where we want to go. So that's where we need to start looking. And most star charts will have you know they'll have everything labeled and then they'll have different uh information for the nebulas and stuff like that they'll have like a bubble or some specific thing that all those should be a key on your star chart that organizes it in some way you look for a particular design in the star chart um you know like uh, in Sky Safari, if it's a planetary nebula, it's a circle and then it has the cross with it. Um, if it's a cluster, it's generally a circle of dots uh, for like a an open cluster. So there's different um, designs. I'm, I'm trying to think about what they are. There's different icons that uh, show different types of objects in the nighttime sky. Um, and you just have to kind of learn how those work. I def definitely recommend downloading Sky Safari and playing with it. Uh, but how I tend to approach it is, let's say we're in Cygnus. Great. Okay, Cygnus is right here. We can see that there's Deneb, there's Alberio, there's the Wings. We know some of the basic stars. We've become oriented that that is Cygnus. And those are the bright stars. Now I need to find where my object is. So let's say we want to find the Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888. If you haven't looked at it, it's awesome. Recommend looking at it. So how we find that is it's close to the middle of Cygnus. So Alberio is right there at the head of Cygnus and there's Deneb these are both naked eye stars and then right in the middle of Cygnus is Sadir I know from my star chart that 
we can see NGC 6088, the crescent, because it's just off of the bright star Sadir. So what I'll generally find is I like to make up triangles or arcs or boxes. I like to play connect the dots with the night sky. And I'll do that with constellations. And then I'll actually take that process. And when I zoom in further to find a galaxy cluster or something faint, I will use the charts and start to map out in my mind like, okay, there's this triangle that points this way and start to hop using the stars to get to where we want to go. So it's kind of like the floor is lava, right? So we want to hop from here to here. And then we know it's right about there is what we're looking for. So here's the Crescent Nebula right here. I don't know why it won't let me click on it, but I'll just have to search it. NGC 6888. Boom. There it is. So that is where our object is. We need to find out how to get there. So this one's very easy. How I would recommend doing it is, okay, we know it's in Cygnus and we know it's just off of the bright star Sadir, which is this guy right here. So first what we're going to do is we'll find Alberia, we'll find a neb and the wings of Cygnus. So there's the neck, there's the tail, Sadir's in the middle. I will probably end up aiming my telescope's finder, the tail rad, at Sadir. And because my uh, tail rad is aligned, the minute I put my finder on Sadir, it'll be in my eyepiece. Great. So now we're a step closer. We're in the constellation now, and we're near one of the brightest stars near this particular target. Let me see if I can actually bring it up. It's probably in here, but I don't know how to set it up. Some of these you can actually set up um, the finder and actually show that Telrad sign there, uh, the target that the Telrad actually puts up. I know there's a way to do it, and I can't figure out how to do it on the fly here. Let's see. Um, yeah, I don't need to bore you guys with any of but anyway there's a way to do it on sky safari as well and uh, you can set all that up in any way you want but anyway what i'll do is i will set my tail rad right here and then in sky safari i will move it over and say like oh the outer ring of the tail rad should be touching sadir and knowing that just on the inside of the other ring, I should be pretty close. So I'll slowly move my telescope up until I start to run over the nebulosity in the region. Eventually you'll find it and it will take a little bit of searching, but that's basically how you star hop. You just kind of go one, two, three, and you just have to kind of become acquainted with the constellations and how the bright stars will guide you to that particular target. Now that's an easy one, or like the ring nebula is very easy. Let's try the ring nebula. So the ring nebula sits right in between uh, these two stars, you know, uh, Soliphat and Shiliac are the two edge stars of Lear the Harp. So here's Vega, here's Shiliac, Here's that. So I, I would probably look for Vega. Vega is going to be your main star. So pop over to Vega, put it in your finder. Great, we're on Vega. Now we know across from Vega, there's Shiliac and Sulfat. And we need to find the ring. And we know the ring nebula is right about in the middle of those two stars. So what I'll do is I'll hop over with my tail rad, bounce over. I'll put my Telrad ring right in the center of those two stars. And odds are the ring's going to be 
pretty close to either in your field of view or just outside the field of view. But I use the main star first, and then I use that to guide me over using the fainter stars, getting me in the region. Once I'm in the region, I'll be able to kind of move the, the telescope around until I actually run over the object that I'm trying to find. In this case, it's the ring nebula. And once it's in there, you should see the little smoky Cheerio looking back at you. And then at that point, you're on target. You can switch filters. You can up the eyepieces, whatever you want to do. But you're basically bouncing from star to star until you get closer and closer to your target of choice. That's how you do it on the easier stuff. When you're talking really faint things, it gets harder. Um, and this is where you have to start kind of making up uh, things as you go. So one of them, for instance, is 3C273. Now, if you're not familiar with 3C273, it is the brightest quasar in the, nor in the northern hemisphere that I know of. Um, and it's a fun one to go after because it's two and a half billion light years away. This is a cool object. It's what I like to call a concept object because there's nothing really flashy about it at all. It looks like a star. What's cool about it is when you find it is how far away it actually is. So it's what's called, I like to call, I guess I coined the term concept object because when you observe it, you need to understand the concept of what you're looking at. So I was taught how to star hop to this object and it's pretty impressive when you're able to do it and i don't know that we'll even be able to do it here because the chart here isn't that detailed but here's how i learned how to do it so it's in virgo first you need to find spica and i like to find all the major stars that make up the main body of virgo but spica is the good start once I find Spica, I need to find the other three stars that make the arc down here. So Porima, probably butcher all these names, Xania, and then you have V Virgo at the very end. In a dark sky site, you should be able to see all four of these stars. Spica, Rima, Y Virgo, and all of these. You should be able to see all of it. So what I find is I find these three stars. One, two, three. Cool. Now from there, we're going to focus on uh, Perima and Zania. Again, I'm probably butchering all of these. Now, what I know about this particular area is I know if I find these two stars, there's another fainter star right up here. FY Virgo, which is a 5.6 magnitude star. That means it is naked eye visible in a dark sky site. I'm able to find this triangle of stars. Or if you want a better one, you could find this one. C Virgo, a little bit brighter. I know that right in here, these, th these four stars or even three stars make triangles or a box. That gives me a, a reference to go off of. Generally, how I will find it is I will see Perima and Zania. I will see those two stars naked eye. And I know roughly that if I know where those two stars and if I made an imaginary point, 3C273 or Quasar is roughly in the 90 degree corner of that. So it'd be like this. So here's our star, one, two, and then three would be right out here somewhere. So we're basically making a 90 degree triangle. So let's search it. See, right there. We're pretty close at that point. So I know that if I find those two stars and I make a 90 degree point out of that, I can drag my tail rad roughly to this position and get on point. Now, when I get on point, I'm going to start looking for certain interesting star structures that I need to find. Now with 3C273, what I find is there's a, it's easier to see, but there's this arc of stars. One, two, three, 
four. These three, these four stars are in an arc. And when you find that arc of stars, you follow it because they get closer and closer together. You see there's the two far ones and the closer and then the closer ones here. You can see that arc in the eyepiece. This is doable in like an eight or 10 inch telescope. So we star hopped, we found the two naked eye stars and then we made an imaginary right angle. We put our Telrad on there. Now that we're in the field, the Telrad gets us in the field. And then we step into the eyepiece. And now we know that we are in the vicinity of the particular target that we want. Now we need to start star hopping within the star field of the object. This is where it gets kind of hard. And you have to start kind of making up your own objects um, and star hopping to it. So let me pull this back up. So here's the arc right here. One, two, three, four. Now 3C273 sits right there and there's actually a small triangle of stars. There's one missing here, which is interesting because 3C273 is the faintest of them. So there's a triangle of stars. One, there should be one over here somewhere. And then 3C273 is the other point of the triangle. So you'll find the triangle in the view. You'll notice because this arc is pointing to the triangle, but more interestingly is this arc is arcing and pointing right to 3C273. So you're gonna see the triangle and the point that the arc points to is the quasar. And then there you go. You can show that to your friends and family or at a star party and it blows their mind because they're looking at an object that's two and a half million light years away from the earth. Um, but that's kind of the trick when you start to star hop is once you learn the constellations, you know that the main stars, if you position your finder between this star and this star or make up a fake triangle and if I know if I put it at this point, I'm close. Then when you step into the eyepiece, you're basically going to take that same mindset, but now you're going to start applying it to smaller star structures that are in the field of view, whether it's a triangle or a box or an arc, you'll find little um, mile markers, if you will, to orient yourself to slowly hop from one thing to the other until you hop to the target. And it takes a little bit of time to kind of orient yourself and get used to it. But that's how I've learned how to find objects. And when you do it enough, like 3C273, which is a very obscure object, it's not super obscure. It's definitely not the hardest thing I've star hopped to. But at first it was like, this is crazy. I need a go-to telescope to find it. It's not that difficult. Once I know that there's Virgo, there's the two naked eye stars. Put the finder right there. Look in the eyepiece. Great. There's the arc because I've done it a few years in a row. There's the arc. Follow the arc and I'm looking for that triangle and the point that the arc points to. 3C273. Easy. Five minutes or less will be able to find that. Now you can apply that type of observing to all types of objects. It just gets more difficult the more obscure and smaller the object actually is. And of course, GoTo makes it easy. You can just 3C273 if it's in there or put the RA in deck and goes right there and finds it. But even with GoTo telescopes, GoTo telescopes are great to get you in the field. It's just like the Telrad. That's the easy part. The hard part is knowing where it is and when it's a big bright object like you know m42 or the pleiades or something that is just obvious that your telescope is on target that's easy but when we're talking about faint galaxy clusters or small planetary nebulas or quasars like the really exotic stuff that requires some effort your go-to system is going to get you close but you're still gonna have to bust out the star chart to kind of figure out if you're actually on the dot. So that's where learning how to star hop is very helpful. Even with a go-to telescope, it's still helpful. The go-to is just gonna get you in the ballpark. 
then the rest is up to you to find exactly which point it is. So that's where I recommend having detailed charts. Get Sky Safari Pro. The reason I think Pro is worth the money is because it has an, a ridiculous database, but it also has millions of stars programmed into it that go fairly faint. And it makes it a lot easier for you to star hop to small objects if you have a very detailed star chart. And the more stars that are in there, the easier it is for you to do it, in my opinion, because it gives you more points to reference. So star hopping is even helpful with a go-to telescope. The reason why Dobsonians are generally very popular with star hopping is because a lot of times they don't have go-to. They don't have computers. You can add it, it's expensive. Um, but they also have the biggest apertures for the most affordable prices. So with a manual DOB, you're actually trading aperture. You're actually gaining the aperture, but losing the convenience of tracking. So it's up to you to be able to find it. Obviously, if you have the budget, you can go ahead and go in and add all the fun stuff to make it easier. But still, even if you're on the target, you might know which one it is, especially when you're hunting quasars because they look like stars. They're stellar looking. So you need to be able to star hop with your mind and imagine here's the triangle, here's this, and match what you're seeing in the chart to what you're seeing in the eyepiece. And it requires that knowledge of how to star hop. Obviously with plate solving and imaging, you don't have to do any of that, but observing with go-to is still a thing. Um, well, I know maybe that wasn't as crystal clear of an explanation as some of you might need. The biggest thing is to go out and practice. This is the method I have developed for myself and it's just, it's helped me find things. So start with a detailed chart, get acquainted with the constellations, know the bright stars and be able to match them up to your chart. And then from there, start looking for those little faint fuzzy targets that are out there and going off the deep end and trying something different. Um, and don't be afraid to do some research. Look up some targets and see what you can find. Some of them are very easy. Star hopping is not a big deal. The challenging stuff is where the fun stuff is at. And it doesn't get any easier when you've got a bigger telescope too because there's all kinds of little fuzzies you're going to run over with more aperture. Um, but that's just how I personally navigate the nighttime sky. You kind of have to find your own flow. But I highly recommend that you become acquainted and learn some of the constellations, learn some of the bright stars. Spend a little time trying to find something without the aid of electronics and seeing how well you do because I do find that it helps sharpen up you as an observer. Um, but anyway, that is just my thoughts on it. Um, if you like what you see here and you wanna support the channel, please go ahead and subscribe, leave a like on a video, let us know we're doing a good job. If you have an idea for uh, an episode, please email us at info at skywatcherusa.com and title it What's Up. Um, but that is pretty much star hopping. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if we need to go back and do it again, I'll be happy to do it. Uh, if you happen to find yourself in an event with me or at Grand Canyon, I will show you personally how to do it um, as well. I'd be happy to show you guys because uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, next week, we're going to have a brand new segment that we've never done here, uh, but we're gonna have our uh, new tech talk with Alex. Now, Alex McClure is our tech support uh, rep. Um, he works with us. If you call on the phone, you're probably talking to Alex. If you email in, you're talking to Alex. So Alex and I are gonna sit down and we're gonna talk shop about common issues that happen with our products and the ways that we recommend getting around it. So this will be a live episode. It will not be pre-recorded. Uh, Alex and I will be sitting down together and uh, we'll be talking shop about some things and answering some questions. So if you have questions, be ready. Um, there's already some topics that we're gonna be covering that are commonly asked in tech support. But if you've got some questions, let us know. This will be a ongoing segment. Probably once a quarter, we'll bring Alex in have some conversations and talk some tech. So that's going to be next week, June 23rd at 10 a.m. It'll be a lot of fun to have you guys here uh, for that as well. But I hope you enjoyed this episode. It is a dark weekend. Please get out, do some observing. Um, I appreciate you guys all watching and we will see you next week with Alex. 
And uh, other than that, have a great weekend. Stay safe, clear skies, and we'll talk to you later. See ya. Bye.